matter where you are in your life, God sees you perfect. No matter where you are in your life, God has a purpose for you. So what people uh, see is not really relevant, or what people don't see is not necessarily relevant. We sometimes go through life thinking we are not relevant or important. So my question for you this morning, have you ever felt like you were not useful? I don't know about you, but I've been there. I, I've been there where I felt like, what is my life? What am I doing? But God. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the letter that Paul wrote to Romans. And yes, we are in week 32. And this is the final chapter. I don't know about you, but it's been quite the journey um, through uh, this text. We're actually going to cover the entire chapter this morning. So I'm not going to read. There are 27 verses uh, in this chapter. And we're going to kind of move through this uh, together, um, as opposed to me just reading uh, everything at one time. Allowed. I will start and read the um, first portion just so that we can get in, and then I'm going to transition and kind of give you guys uh, some direction. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 16, I commend to you your sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have a need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. And I'll just leave it there for right now. This morning, we end our journey through Paul's letter to the Romans. And I almost wish, I know some of you don't, but I, I almost wish that we uh, weren't ending um, this uh, journey. Uh, for me, it has been a journey of a lifetime, truly. Um, and really because it, 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 it's been this, this journey that has allowed uh, me to witness uh, this theological masterpiece uh, that is named Romans, the letter to the Romans. And in this final chapter, Paul thanks the countless people, most of whom he has never met. And he thanks them for their faithfulness, not to him, but their faithfulness to the gospel. Part 32 this morning is entitled, I See You. Paul's writing this letter from Corinth to people he's never met, who he's only heard about. And he says, no matter the fact that we are separated by distance, I see what God is doing through each of you. When I think of Ukraine right now, because it's on everybody's mind and, and what is potentially can happen, we don't know them personally, but we see them. And we love them in Christ as Paul loved the Romans in Christ. This journey um, has brought us along a road 
uh, for lack of a better term, I, I didn't uh, mean, you know, because all of us have heard about the Roman road. When we share the gospel with somebody, we might take them down uh, the Roman road. But this is a journey that has brought us along a road that introduced us to who we were, listen to this, who we were before Christ what Christ did for us so that we would be saved. He tells us how to be saved in this letter and what to do once we are saved. If you remember, we talked about this, this idea, that, that, that movement of a progressive sanctification, that from the moment of our conversion to Christ Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, he began a work in us. And that work continues all the days of our lives. In Philippians 1.6, you might get tired of hearing me say this verse, but it should be committed to your memory. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He sees you. Whether you realize it or not, he sees you. He knows you. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He saw you. He gives us this promise in this letter that he will never let us go. Paul writes and says that nothing in chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So no matter what, what uh, traversing you might do, what hills and valleys you go into, God's con consistency never changes. He loved you from day one. He will love you till he calls you home. And nobody, no evil can separate you from that love. And then he says to us in this letter that we have a call. In, in chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, of good tidings, the gospel. Because without the gospel, we have nothing. Without uh, walking into a darkness of the world with the light inside of you, there is nothing. And that light is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He tells us that we need to go across the globe. That, that we have to tell everyone about Jesus. We, we as a church, as a congregation, we, we pray. We, we have a heart uh, for mission. We have a heart for evangelism. It starts right here in our own house, and then we push it out to the uttermost parts of the world. And finally, in this final chapter, Paul gives recognition and direction to all who are in Christ Jesus. That's where we are. It's sometimes, I hope you have read along with me, but when you look at chapter 16, literally the first 16 verses are, are a benediction, a, 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 a hey, you know, here's a cheers and, and, and all that kind of stuff to everybody uh, that uh, is associated uh, with Paul. It's the longest of all of the letters that he writes. It's the most detailed uh, in terms of who he's talking about. And he speaks of people in these first 16 verses who, with the exception of Priscilla and her husband Aquila, 
You never hear about them in the rest of the New Testament. So to think, and why is that important? Because us sitting in this place, perhaps nobody has ever given you recognition that you want. But God sees you. And even if it's just one time for a fleeting moment that you see the good in what Christ is doing through you, he has recognized you. That is motivation for us to continue to move forward, to take the gospel into the darkness. I've got three points for you this morning. And the first one's going to cover 16 verses. And it's entitled, Big Shout Out to My Peeps. We see you. Big shout out to my peeps. I want to go East Coast, but I, I'll, I'll refrain. Listen, I wouldn't be me if I threw just a little bit of that in there. I got to. Our second point this morning will cover verses 17 through 20. And that is, beware of what is not seen. Beware of what is not seen. If you're taking notes, underline the word not. And our third point this morning, as we conclude, I, can, I still can't believe we're done with Romans. You know, we started in like May of last year, uh, walking through this, May or June, I think. But our third point, we have your back. We have your back back. In verses 1 and 2 that I just read, he talks about Phoebe. What is the significance behind Phoebe? Because when you're looking at the Greek in, in, in the way that he describes her, he's calling her a deacon, basically. This is a woman of authority that has ministered alongside of him. She doesn't go to the Roman church. She's in, in um, uh, Mama Maya, uh, uh, Centria, okay? And that's outside of Corinth, far from Rome. And yet he trusts her with this letter to bring it to the Roman church. And he says, I, I commend to you, I commend to you, your, our, uh, our sister Phoebe, who is a servant, uh, and the, the Greek word is uh, diakon, I think is how it's pronounced, uh, diakone, um, and it, as a servant, the, you see that word in the Greek used for deacon. So when I use the word doulos, which is a servant, a slave, that relates more towards the idea of a bondservant when Paul calls himself a bondservant. This is truly a servant of the Lord. A bondservant is a slave that never gets released. And so Paul says, I'm a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Phoebe, uh, her importance uh, is that of women in ministry. So often, especially within the Southern Baptist Convention, nobody's watching, are they? Um, but uh, women sometimes feel like they're an aside. And I want to share with you this morning that Paul specifically puts Phoebe out front so that people recognize the importance of women in ministry and ministering to one another. He talks about Phoebe. Phoebe is a, her name means a bright, uh, bright and radiant. Um, she has been a great help. Then he says to her, receive her as we should receive one another in the church. That she is with you and me. She is an intricate part of the movement of the gospel, the success of letting everyone know who Jesus Christ is. She probably helped, if not herself, started that church 
where she is from. She has worked alongside Paul in the ministry, battling along with him. And then he points out uh, in verses three and three to five, he says, "Greet uh, Prisca and Aquila, uh, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks. They risked their necks for the cause of the gospel, for Paul himself, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches." Of the Gentiles. Also, listen to this greet the church, uh, also greet the church that is uh, in their house. Greet uh, Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. He mentions all these people. Why? Because he wants them to be seen. God wants you to be seen. You don't have to cower underneath and think for a second, I'm not good enough. We're living in a world today, unfortunately, that says if you don't think this way, you're no good. Shame on them for trying to project that type of ideology. We are seeing an evil despot with nothing but an attitude of Shock and awe to take over Europe. If you think for one second he does not want to do that, then you need to take a breath and start thinking. Paul mentions these incredible people because nobody else has. They, they have been faithful in the work, just like you are faithful in the work every single day. I want you to know that you are seen. God knows you. He knows every hair on your head as he knows every grain of sand in the desert. He points out Priscilla and Aquila who risked their lives for Paul and the gospel. What were they? They were missionaries. What are we? We are missionaries. That's who we are. We are missionaries whether we travel across the globe or we just knock on our neighbor's door next door to us. We are missionaries of the gospel, commanded to bring the good news to everyone that we come in contact with. They were missionaries. For those of you that don't know, Russ and Jack do because these are uh, two, two sets of friends that we know from a previous church. But my friend Hubert and Sean D, and Hubert used to be on staff uh, at uh, uh, Houston Northwest. He was a family pastor at the time. He and his wife have been in Ukraine as IMB missionaries for many years. We haven't heard, at least I haven't heard um, from them uh, in terms of where they are and how they're, they're moving, if they're moving to get out of the country. I, I don't know. Their mission and why they went to the Ukraine, went to Ukraine was because of a specific people group called the Tsetsis, which is a Muslim group that was kicked out of Ukraine and then came back into Ukraine, and they have been share, sharing the gospel with this people group. Prior to Hubert and Shondi was a couple that have visited here um, when um, uh, we had uh, Jack's dad's uh, memorial service, uh, Lois and Virgil. I won't mention their last names. But Lois and Virgil also spent several years in Ukraine as missionaries for the International Mission Board, which is the sending um, division of the Southern Baptist Convention. Whether you realize it or not, the IMB, the International Mission Board, sends more missionaries than any other de denomination 
in evangelical Christendom. Missionaries. We are all missionaries. And Paul points this out. And he says in, in verses, really verses 6 through 15, and I'll share this with you. Greet Mary, uh, who has uh, worked hard for you. Uh, greet, and he goes on, he says, greet all these people who, who are outstanding among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. He's pointing out people that have, have heard the gospel, who were saved even before Paul. Remember, what was Paul doing? Paul was standing there in chapter 8 of uh, the book of Acts, and the people's, uh, Stephen's clothes were being thrown at his feet while they stoned Stephen to death. And when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, and people heard about Paul, right? Saul. Right? They say, Saul, who's Paul? No, Saul is now Paul. Why? Because Jesus has named him Paul. And they said, I don't want that guy anywhere around us. I don't trust him. God saw Saul even in the midst of his iniquity. And he called him out. He has called every single one of us. He's called us out for the purpose of the gospel. Get excited about it, man. God loves us so much. You know, we hear all this fire and brimstone and crazy, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, if you read between that line and all of that rhetoric, it's about love. If we're not loving one another, we see what happens. If you lose love, all bets are off. All bets are off. So we make a point of embracing all who serve. They are all seen by God and should be given their due for their commitment to Jesus Christ. That's really the crux of verses uh, uh, 5 or 6, uh, through, uh, six uh, through 15. In verse 16... It's an issue. You hear this a lot, right? And I'm going to go through a, to a couple of different um, scriptures. Through the advent of COVID, people don't shake hands anymore. They fist bump, right? Give me an elbow. Hey, how you doing? I'm all right. How you doing? I feel like a chicken wing, right? I fist bump, invariably, I'm fist bumping with somebody who's got this monstrosity of a ring, and they hit my, they hit my hand, and then my hand is like this for two days because I can't move it. But Paul says in verse 16, what does he say? He's sending these people. He's sending um, Phoebe. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Greet one another. Listen, if you flip quickly uh, to 1 first, uh, first Corinthians uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 20, what does it say? Well, I'm going to read it for you. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, what does it say? 13, verse 12, it says, greet one another with what? With a holy kiss. If, if you go to 1 Thessalonians, if I can get to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Last one. I have to go there. I can't help it. First Peter. First Peter 5.14. He says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. That statement that Paul uses often is like you and I shaking hands. But there's an intimacy about it 
that says, man, we love one another, those of us who are in Christ. In other cultures, you will see uh, specifically on, on the side of the world where you would go uh, to uh, Turkey or Greece and, and areas like that, uh, in Europe as well, when, when men greet one another, they'll kiss each other on both cheeks. When, when, when men see women just as friends, they will kiss one another on both cheeks. It is a way of shaking hands. Don't look any deeper into that than what it is. Because in today's day and age, everything's an HR issue. <laughs> so thankful we don't have an HR department here at the church. <laughs> Kidding. Um, but Paul goes through this process of, let me give you a big shout out. He doesn't know a lot of these people. He's heard about them. But in Christ, he feels as though there's this commonality that bridges the gap because they're in Christ. If you look around the sanctuary, you should love one another who are in Christ. We are brothers and sisters. We have a commonality, a, 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 a link to one another. Doesn't matter how you look, doesn't matter. I, I talk about this all the time. We are in Christ. We have to treat each other that way. The jibber-jabbering that goes on within churches that causes splits. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was telling me this horrific story about a split in their church over nonsense. Where are you in Christ? That was my question. Churches should not split. My class that I'm taking right now, and this is why it's so important in terms of what Paul was, was sending out to the, to the church in Rome. The, the class that I'm taking that is killing me these last eight weeks is leading change in the local church. And it's dealing with conflict resolution. And you would be amazed at how many people, the way that they deal with conflict resolution is avoidance. Well, if I don't say anything, maybe it'll all go away. You can't have that. Confront whatever it is that's going on. Love one another in Christ. Agree to disagree sometimes. But come up with a, a plan of action that does not dissolve the cause of Christ. Big shout out to my peeps. We see you. Second point this morning is beware of what is not seen. Underline not. That's going to cover verses 17 and 20. Listen to this, because this is where we're at right now. If you look at it from a perspective of, of the church, this is the struggle that so many churches have. All you have to do is pick up the paper and take a look and see what's going on within the confines of the Southern Baptist Convention. People are freaking out in the SBC. I mean, between all the sexual harassment nonsense that's going on, then they, go and they hire a law firm that is attached to the LGBTQ movement, okay? And they have now, they, they've poured in like $2 million to this law firm, so people are freaking out because they are attached to, I mean, it's like, it's so, where have we lost the purpose of what Christ has done with us? And that is to, one, love one another. Two, to understand that Christ died for every single person. That it is not our place to cast judgment. God will do all the judging. Our job is to bring the gospel. Our job is to love one another. Our job is to lift people up when they're down. That's our job as Christians. Beware of what is not seen. Verses 17 through 20, listen to this. Now I urge you, brethren... Keep your eyes on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own 
appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Verse 19. For the report of your obedience has reached, uh, has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in, uh, in what is evil. The God of peace will soon, listen, crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. If you look at this church here, and you look at the church in Rome, this is a, a group of, of believers. Paul is lifting them up, and yet he says, beware. Beware of false teaching. Beware of people who uh, are thinking not of the ministry, but thinking of what it is that they want. Paul warns the Romans. In verse 17, it says, watch out for those who cause dissension. What do they want to do? They want to stop the gospel from moving forward. That's what they want to do. They, they uh, bring resistance to what we know is true. What's an example of that? Well, in, in Paul's time, it was the Judaizer, the, this Jewish believer who felt that it wasn't enough to have the gospel. You had to have the law. And that's completely contrary to what Christ came here to do. He goes, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. So as a result of his fulfilling the law, hey, I don't need all that other stuff. My believing in Christ is all I need. And the scriptures are clear about that. <coughs> Excuse me. They bring resistance to what we know is true. They want you to turn from the truth. Today, in the church today, here's an example. There's that person or people who run around and they say, you don't really want to do that, do you? See, we don't want to do this, and, 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 and you don't want to do that. And what they do is, is they get you to veer off of the path that God would have you on. Here's a, a, I'll give you an example of a specific church. I might have spoken of this church before. The pastor today is pastoring Crossroads uh, Baptist Church uh, up, up, up here in the Woodlands. But he was, him and his wife were called to a church in Florida. It was a huge mega church. He was preaching in view of a call. That means that for the most part, this was a formality. He was, he was giving them his, his gusto in, in this um, a moment of, of uh, uh, preaching so that everybody would affirm. And everything looked perfect, except there was one guy. One guy who kept going in and out. And he got people to believe that because this pastor is black and he's married to a white woman, he has no place to be pastoring the church. And he got enough people to buy into it. That church today is almost dead. It was a mega church. But he single-handedly, what do we hear about the mustard seed? This little bitty tiny mustard seed. Amazing how much it can do. If you look at a little bit of yeast, it spreads and rises. This is exactly what's going on. Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, guys, take a breath. Remember what we're doing. Don't let these outside forces mess with your head so that you stop the purpose and plan of what it is that God has for you. And so he goes on, he says, they bring resistance to what we know is true. In verses 18 and 19, these are evil doers who love, listen, they love the world and not God. Bottom line. And there, you ever meet those silver-tongued 
people, man, they, stuff rolls out of their mouth. It is about as sweet as sweet can be. But, you know, the tongue goes in two directions. It's forked. They love their own appetites, he says, Paul. They're interested in it for themselves. They're not interested in it for the good of, and the cause of Christ. They deceive with their smooth speaking tongues. I knew several people in my life like that. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. What, what's, what's the importance behind that statement? If you are not rooted in who you are in Christ, it's very, very easy to sway you. Very easy. So when I stand here before you and I talk about how important it is to be uh, in the Word of God, reading the Word of God, asking questions. You know, Zach asks me questions. I haven't answered any of them yet, but he asks me questions all the time. Russ asks me questions. Grace, on, on Wednesday night when we were here at church doing uh, Wednesday night Bible study, I could barely get through a lesson because Grace had questions. It was the Pranada, the Pranada hour is what we called it. But do you understand the importance behind that? That tells me that Grace is in the Word. She's thinking. She wants to make sure she understands what Christ is doing in her life, just like everybody. If you're not in the Word, a smooth-talking, silver-tongued devil comes along and will fill your head with all kinds of nonsense, and you don't know. Takes you away from the truth. He deceives the hearts of the unsuspecting. And then he says in verse 19, I'll read, well, yeah, I'll read it, verse 19. He says, for the report of your obedience has reached to all. He says, hey, you guys are doing great. Keep it up. When I look out into this sanctuary, I look at these incredible, wonderful, believing Christian people. And I say to you, you're doing great. You might not think so, but God knows your heart. God knows how great you really are. Don't worry about what anybody else says. I look out into this sanctuary, sanctuary and I just see Christ. That's what I see. That fills my heart every week that I am given the honor to stand before you and I get to look out and I see Christ in every single one of you. He says to them, have no fear. In verse 20, why? Because God has a plan. I don't have to have a plan. It's good to have a plan. I'm not saying don't have a plan. But God's plan is the perfect plan. So if you're going to make a plan, I would kind of line up with the big man upstairs. I'm just saying. Line up with him. Why? Because in the midst of calamity, in the midst of lies, in the midst of somebody trying to get you to veer off of his road, he will crush Satan. Crush him. That's how much he loves you. You understand that we, we hear that when Christ went to the cross, what did he do? He didn't just die. He didn't just raise up on the third day. He, he, he didn't just leave an empty tomb. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. And Satan has no hold on anybody who is in Christ Jesus. Time-wise, we don't have to go there. But I, I want to encourage you 
uh, to go to 2 Corinthians um, chapter, uh, let's go. You know what, we're on a roll. Let's, let's, let's love Jesus a little bit longer. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Our adequacy is from God, folks. I'm not strong enough to fight, but Christ in me sure is. And that's how we have to think. He used Paul, listen, he used Paul in both word and deed. He uses each of us in both word and deed. One of the other classes that I'm taking is what's called an applied ministry class. And I'm working through this workbook. And part of it is understanding what my spiritual gifts are. No comments. But what I have found is that part of my gifting is exhortation, is being an encourager, is bringing the word, is preaching. That's what prophecy is about. Not that I predict the future, but this idea of prophecy is bringing God's truth. Paul says, uh, or God says through Paul, he does it through word and deed. That, that God has called me to be a servant. However that might look, I serve. I am obedient to what God has called me to do, just as you must look in the mirror and say, what is God calling me to do? I want to be obedient to whatever it is that he wants us to do. Here's our third point. We have you back. Sometimes that's hard to believe. And, and, and quite frankly, in the world today, when you're getting beat up every single day, it's hard to believe that anybody's got you back. When I think about what must be going through the minds of, of people in Ukraine right now, yeah, I keep bringing Ukraine up. Why? Because I just cannot believe in the 21st century we're experiencing this again. I just can't. You know, some of you were alive during the Second World War. I, I came along 15 years, 16 years after the end of the Second World War. It was still fresh. It was still fresh. People today, I was reading someplace from a pastor in Texas who was talking about one of, one of the youth that he was teaching who recognized that Hitler was a bad, but I, can't, I won't call him evil. And, and the pastor said, he was evil. Putin is evil. And the fact of the matter is, God has your back. Don't worry about the, the, the circumstances of the moment. We have your back. How does Paul exhibit that? Well, if we take a look at verse 21 of uh, chapter 16, he goes on, he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. What, what is important about this? Well, Timothy is Paul's son in the faith. Timothy was a very well-respected, recognized person. And the point of saying this is that even Timothy wants to let you know he, he hears you. He, he sees you. You are seen. These are fellow missionaries working with uh, Paul in Corinth. Remember, this is where he's writing the letter. Lucius, probably, I can neither confirm nor deny, but Lucius is probably Luke, who wrote the gospel according to Luke, and also who wrote Acts, who was traveling with Paul. They call them relatives, but they weren't, they weren't true relatives. They were, they were kinsmen in the faith with him. They were family in that sense. You know, we, we're not blood related, but I consider each of you my family. 
This is family. Susan and I look at this church and we think of each and every individual as part of our family. Something totally off kilter. Tertius. If you read verse 22, listen to this. I, Tertius, or Tertius Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. That is a great deal of latitude that Paul gave to his scribe. You don't see that very often. But Paul felt it important enough that even the one who is penning this letter for Paul is greeting those he's never met. So that they understand that they're seen. That they understand that no matter what trial or tribulation they're going through, we got your back. We got you. We're all good. And then he goes on and he says, Gaius and Erastus and Cortus, th these were um, loosely city officials in Corinth. But they were Corinthian believers. So when you're discouraged and you think nobody sees you, or that they only see the, the, the part of you that you don't want them to see, Understand that God has your back. Understand that God sees you in who you are in Christ Jesus. Paul puts all of this together so that the church in Rome, even though they're doing well, they are susceptible, just like you and I are susceptible, to outside influences. Stay focused. Stay focused. The purpose of who we are and what we do. In verses 25 through 27, as he closes this letter, this, this whole, you know, he's got several doxologies that go through here. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. Listen, verse 26. But now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Oh my goodness. The gospel is power. If you go back to, to chapter 1, um, it says, For I am not ashamed, in verse 16 of chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. He says, you are made strong by the gospel and Jesus himself. He says, the gospel saves sinners like you and me. So when you see a sinner, don't say, oh, you're a sinner. No, we are sinners. Saved by grace through faith. That's who we are. So the next time you want to pass judgment on somebody else... Why don't you encourage them instead? Encourage them in who you are in Christ and who they are in Christ and lift them up. And if they don't know Jesus, explain the gospel to them. The good news, it's a simple process. Our journey, as I conclude this morning, and Russ and Jack are coming up, but our journey has taken us over some difficult terrain. I know that. It's hard to say that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's hard to say that the wages of sin are death. And it's hard to say and to understand that even while we were yet sinners, there was a Christ who died for each and every one of us. That is the God that we serve. He is unbelievable. He is not a, 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 a 
fake facade of your imagination. He is the true living Christ. He lives inside of you when you call upon his name. He directs every footstep. He stops you from being taken aside by that silver-tongued Yahoo who wants nothing but to take you down a road that is contrary to what God would have for you. Stand firm in who you are in Christ and know that the gospel is the power that you have been given. This journey that we have taken over some difficult terrain, but the, the message from Paul has been consistent throughout. Jesus saves, and when he does, you're in the family for eternity. And he tells us that nothing can separate us from him. And by faith, we believe in our hearts. We profess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and we are saved. We spend the rest of our days working towards being more like him. And I hope that you are doing that every day that you wake up. Don't, don't be distracted by evildoers. Because even, as I said, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're not, you're not here by accident today. You're not. God had a message for every one of us this morning. If you're watching, God had a message for you. And that's why you came to us on this live stream so that you might hear the truth behind what God does for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's got your back. He sees you. And he tells us not to be fooled by the evil of Satan. God has a plan for each of us. And this sometimes is even hard for me to say, but you're not invisible. You're not. Some of us think, who's going to see me? What, what can I do? God has his hand on you already, and he loves you. I see you. God sees you. I want to I call you guys, come to the altar. Come to the altar and just lay it all out this morning. And if you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, then guys, today is that day.